Welcome to Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by Amy Canavan and Colin Watt. Welcome to the show guys. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, cheers Paul. It's an absolute pleasure. Amy, you're making your Axon debut. How are you feeling? A little bit nervous. Pre-match nerves. Pre-match nerve, exactly. <laughs> now there's plenty obviously to talk about in the world of Celtic. Um, I'm aware of the fact, Colin, that sometimes it feels like Groundhog Day. You know, we're talking about the same old stuff, talking about the same old changes, but that's because we're influenced by the narrative, we're influenced by what's happening or not at Celtic Park. Now, there has been developments overnight, we have seen further protests, and I think, and as I've said in the lead uh, into this this episode, I think further protests are inevitable in paradise. Um, we are learning a lot through social media, Colin, as to what's happening. There's a big police presence around Celtic Park. How can you see this developing over the next few days? I mean, you, you asked this on uh, Sunday after the game, and uh, as I said at the time, I, I, I knew he wasn't going to get a sack because for whatever reason, the board seemed to have this backing of him and they seem to be that they're the only ones that can see him turning this around. I don't see him turning it around, but the way that they've treated the fans over the last couple of weeks, for me... It's been shambolic. The way that they've came out and they've um, said that the, the things that are happening are wrong. And yes, OK, the, the violence that we've seen was completely wrong. But there's peaceful protests there as well. You see these banners coming up. i seen that they get taken down last night, the banners mm-hmm. that went up. Mm-hmm. The police presence turned up because the banners were there. It, the fans are trying to put this point across to the board that just aren't listening, that the time is up and something needs to change. And if it wasn't for the fans, Celtic Football Club would be nothing. So it's about time that they actually listen to what the fans want and instead of just being so ignorant to them. We've been very critical on the show, Colin, over the last few weeks um, regarding that lack of engagement from the club. Amy, do you think that we've got a lot of different associations, we've got a lot of different groups uh, of organised Celtic supporters. Uh, do you think there's a better way? Do you think that uh, we could communicate and some form of protest could be organised whereby we are not breaking any rules? Because everybody wants to, to look upon people protesting and say, what rules are they breaking? How can we remove them from the stadium? Um, do you think there could be an effort where some groups come together and say this is what we're going to do to make our feelings known because I mean tomorrow night obviously we've got another game who knows how that's going to end up I must admit I'm not very confident and then we're looking at 2 and 13 and it just gets worse and worse Um, I think the Celtic fans after that initial frustration and outpouring maybe of emotion over the last uh, couple of weeks maybe after the Ross County game in particular they will become organised because that's what Celtic fans do well they can become organised and maybe approach this uh, in a way that um, you know the criticism can't really be coming our way Absolutely. I think you're right in the sense that there needs to be a sense of unity from organisations. Um, sorry, it's hard with the um, echo. But, um, yeah, I hope so. Uh, it's hard in the current climate, I think, because no matter what, it's going to be social distancing and it's not going to be, no matter how many organisations come together, it's going to be one of those ones that it's like, they will be breaking rules no matter what but I think in recent times you look at the banners last night they weren't the most harmful there was apparently comments that was, everything was socially distanced and that was the same over the weekend so it's just there, there's always going to be complaints and, and we all know that but I think there does need to be a sense of unity from these organisations because that is um, what they're what they're there to do really I think that when we're looking at what's been happening around the park, I mean, unfurling of banners, you know, obviously the Green Brigade tried that um, earlier on. They did try to get the point across. Uh, It just feels as though the fans, no matter um, how many of them or what groups are involved, are being looked upon with with a degree of contempt. Um, Therefore, I I think that, you know, if if they do communicate and they are able to organise something um, in the form of a, a protest which is peaceful, Um, then again they can't be criticised for that because I think um, when you look at when you look at what Colin said there regarding protests I mean the fans are everything but Colin there wouldn't be a club without protests and I keep saying that going back um, yeah. to the the bad old days of the early 90s I mean without the protests there would be absolutely nothing there, would, there, there wouldn't be any club to support so I'm all for that 
uh, obviously without breaking any COVID regulations that are in place. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't ask anybody to do that, but there's enough people who are feeling the same way now. Um, before we have a look at the, the potential aftermath of anything going wrong tomorrow night or on Sunday. Let's have a wee look at the game, Colin. Let's talk about football for a bit. Um, tomorrow night, what do you expect to happen? Because I'll tell you, last week, I certainly didn't expect Scott Brown to start the game with St Johnston um, coming up on the Sunday. Do you think Neil Lennon, once again, will will go with his tried and tested? He seems to show a lot of loyalty to certain players yeah. who play whenever they're fit. Yeah, I, I think that's been one of Neil Lennon's downfalls this season as he continues to do his tried and tested and any time that I've suggested that we bring in some different players, we bring in some of the younger players to come through, I see a lot of comments saying, oh we can't do this because the games are so important but this game's a complete write-off on Thursday night. Um, it's not going to make any difference, okay, you'll get the, the odd, um, the, you'll get £500,000 if you win the game but this is a chance for us to actually try something different. We know what we're doing right now isn't working. And there's guys out there that we've been crying out for them to get minutes. I'd like to see Greg Taylor come in and give Luxell a bit of a rest. I'd like to see Turnbull come in. I would like to see Sorrow come in. I would like to see if Griffiths can start a game. There's guys in that squad that we can turn to on Thursday night that will actually get something um, for us. When you look at it... Uh, Mickey Johnson played 45 minutes for the Celtic Colts the other day in a 3-0 victory over Rangers, um, which I'll, I'll speak about later on. But guys like Shane Duffy, let's get them in. Let's give these guys minutes because at some point we're going to have to turn to these guys because it's not working at the minute. Two wins in 12 with the players that we've got shows that we actually need to start making some changes in the squad. What do you think, Kim? I mean, when I look at the, the lineup last Thursday... I mean, it's typical, Lenny, to be honest with you, but surely you can't make the same mistake again. We're looking at tomorrow night. We don't want um, a humbling. We certainly don't want another humbling. We are uh, in line for being the worst ever performing team in the Europa League history. You know, that that might happen tomorrow night. Uh, but surely we're looking ahead to Kilmarnock. We're looking to the point where we need to st- we need to start winning games and we need to start getting a win together. Um, regardless of who's in charge, because the board have told us we're not listening to you and Neil Lennon's going to be in charge. So I'm now looking at Celtic and saying we need to string together a run of wins in the league. So with that in mind, do you think Neil Lennon might try one or two players who haven't had many games recently? As much as I'm a one to, I don't think he will. I think he'll persevere with Scott Brown and I think uh, Edward will start up top and I don't know if Laxalt's carrying a little injury, but I think he'll still start if he's remotely fit. As much as I don't want him to, I think it's vital that David Turnbull gets a, a start. I think Colin's spot on. I'd like to see if Griffiths can start and get an hour instead of just getting half an hour at the end Um, but it's one of these ones that Lennon I I think he'll go with Brown like last week I think we discussed it before that why in these dead rubber games is Scott Brown getting getting minutes he's not he's needing a break more than anyone Um, I think he'll go with them tomorrow though and I think he'll say it's the need for continuity um, instead of going with Turnbull but like Colin said I'd like Turnbull I'd like Sorrow who is at least sort of like returned to even the fringe of these in recent weeks. Um, I think everyone has sort of forgot about him. But I'd like to see Griffiths start. Greg Taylor, who I, I think actually was outstanding. Maybe outstanding is a little bit too eager, but I think he was a, I think he was being harshly done by with Lax out coming in. Um, I don't think he's put many through strong, but I'd definitely like to see Turnbull start. I think Turnbull's almost an obvious one now because uh, when we looked at the transfer business, Colin, we looked at um, a group of players coming in who were perhaps of a higher calibre on paper than some of the transfer windows previously. I mean, when we go into the transfer market in January and buy Sorrow and Klamala, um, I mean, these were largely project players. I think we had a different approach this time round. And I'm guessing that's with ten, the 10 uh, in mind. And we've gone out, we've, we've brought players in and we're not playing them. I mean, you look at some of the European defeats and there's a couple of the new guys are playing. El Yunus 
Ducey, yes, he is a new player, but he was here all the last season as well. Um, Turnbull, for me, is an obvious one. He needs to get game time. I think what we've seen from him and what we've seen from the tempo of Celtic's play when he came on against St. Johnson means that I would definitely find a way to play Turnbull. And this isn't me having a go at Scott Brown. And and by the way, I don't think Scott Brown's the worst performer that we've got. Um, But I think we do need to start introducing some legs into this team and Turnbull would be a good start. Mm-hmm. When we look no. at the transfer, the transfer window again, Colin. Uh, one thing that is pretty clear is we started this season with one wide player. I mean, obviously we've tried to adapt Frimpong because yeah, I don't think he's a, a full back, but obviously we bought him as a full back. We're trying to adapt him, and there's still areas of his game that he needs to work on. Um, but you know, he's the only wide player we've got now that Forrest is injured, and that surely um, was something that. We need to criticise a number of people for, but we need to criticise the head of recruitment. I mean, we know that they have these meetings because one of the the minutes, the sheets, a couple of the sheets were actually leaked, <laughs> you know, not that long ago. Um, so we know that the head of recruitment's in these meetings, the manager, the scouts, Peter Lowell has an input. Um, is it about time that we had a look at the head of recruitment and what what they've done wrong, as well as Neil Lennon? Yeah, I think you're right. But when you look at the the players that we targeted, um, and everyone keeps going back to Ivan Tony, because I think he's got something like 15 goals in 17 games for Brentford. But when you look at the way Brentford's playing at the minute, he's getting the service for him to put the chances in the back of the net. A lot said about Albin Ayeti and how he hit the post the other day, but he doesn't get the service. We're not creating enough chances. There's not enough balls coming in for them to try and put it away. When he started at Celtic, he was on a run of, I think it was six goals in six games or something like that. But he was getting the service, he was getting the chances to create the goals. We're not creating enough as a team. A lot of the time the ball goes out wide and the cross comes over and it doesn't get past the first man. And that's that's just the way that Celtic's playing at the minute. We're not getting through the defences that have been set up. And when you talk about the wide players, now it's good to see that um, we've seen Mikey Johnson come back for the Celtic Colts the other day, he got 45 minutes. Um, and he played well. Karamoko Dembele, someone that we've been speaking about on the mm. podcast as being a sort of forgotten star. He played the full 90 minutes. Armstrong local flex. He got a goal plus an assist. And you've got a young boy there, Cameron Harper, a 19-year-old right winger who's been in the fringes of the squad, has scored two goals against Rangers. So why is it that we've got these players that are showing what they can do for the youth side that aren't getting the chance to even come on and maybe play 15, 20 minutes to show what they can do in the main team? I think, and again, I'm up for anyone proving me wrong, I think that's because that's not what Neil Lennon does. You look at the history, and I'll come over to yourself, look at the history of Neil Lennon at Celtic. How many players has he introduced from the youth team and developed? Now, the big obvious one is James Forrest. You've obviously seen Forrest as a young player before he broke into the first team. He gave him his chance in the first team and he's developed under Lennon and whilst Lennon's been away. Now, how many other players? Now, you mentioned Mikey Johnson there. Has he developed under Neil Lennon? Because I think the injury, and obviously you'll remember that because when he was trudging up the tunnel, Neil Lennon had some choice words for him. How many players has Neil Lennon introduced and actually developed, and I'm not talking about signings, young players through the ranks. Now, I know that we were forced to try and play Stephen Welsh against Rangers. He was then, you know, pitched up against Ibrahimovic. Um, I don't know if that's done the boy any good, to be honest with you, but um, we should have, Colin, you've mentioned three or four guys there, we should have always at Celtic Football Club three or four players who are breathing down the necks of the first team um, and it shouldn't be in a situation where we're in crisis that we throw them in they should have been nurtured before now would I be confident that Dembele would make an impact on the Celtic side no chance would I be confident that even Mikey Johnson coming back from injury he's certainly not the guy we can put all our hopes on and why is that because they've not been nurtured or developed properly Okoflex has never played for the first team um, and there's so many of these guys that were thrown well and he'd only played one game and we're expecting him to play against Rangers and AC Milan so I think that what's coming through this crisis that we're in at the moment is Celtic have become complacent over the years Amy uh, we were in a position of strength 
and in a position of strength where we had virtually no challenge for years and years. I mean, we're beating Rangers 5-1, 5-0, 4-1, yet we never had an eye on anything other than just maintaining that dominance. We weren't building anything behind the scenes. We weren't looking ahead. We've heard the examples of Ajax building a team, selling them off, building another team, selling them off. Celtic haven't done that. And Neil Lennon doesn't do it because if we need a player, we identify a player, he buys it. If the player works great, if he doesn't, he replaces him. But he doesn't nurture talent through the youth. Do you think that um, regardless of what happens this season, there's going to be a different approach from Celtic AMA in terms of um, forward planning? It doesn't appear as though we've, everything seems to be just step by step. That's fine because winning games and winning trophies masks a million deficiencies. And that's what's happened with Celtic. There's a problem by a player. We need a centre half by a player. Sometimes it works, Boyata, for example. Sometimes it doesn't, Marvin Comper. And if it doesn't work, buy another one. And if that doesn't work, buy Julian. We just don't nurture. We don't have these people. You've mentioned them, Colin, because they're probably the star men in that team. They're mm-hmm. not ready for the first team. Mikey Johnson's unfit, of course. The other ones you mentioned, they're not ready because they haven't been nurtured properly. And that's a massive issue. Now, every club is up against that problem whereby we don't have a reserve team. So you're, you're going from youths to first team. Celtic just need to combat that. And if that means that you set up uh, games against other clubs of a similar stature from all over Europe to make sure that they're getting a challenge so that when we need to start introducing them into the first team, we can. But we're in a situation where come January... I don't trust any of the names you've said to come in and make an impact, Colin. And that's our fault as a club. But Neil Lennon certainly doesn't have a track record of it. So, Amy, coming back to yourself, do you think Celtic need to change their approach, their whole strategy uh, going forward, regardless of what happens this season? Yeah, absolutely. I think they do. But will they? I don't think they will. And I I think you're spot on. You're saying that in Lennon's even his two two, uh, managerial stints, James Forrest is a standout, obviously. But even looking at that period of time in the midst of it, in between with Dyla and with Brendan Rodgers, really the only player who's came from the academy and made their, their mark is Callum McGregor. That was Ronnie Dyla. That wasn't even Brendan Rodgers. So you're right. And the names that Colin has said, they they are... Well, we perceive them to be exceptional talents, and that's that is what we see. But do we know that they're going to make it on the on the big game? We have no idea because, like you see, they are not ready. But you look at even likes of like over the years, Calvin Miller, Anthony Ralston. Um, they had they showed all this great potential, and it looked a certainty. Owen O'Connell from years and years ago. Yeah. I think he's now done it at Berry, um but he's down in the lower leagues of English football and that's just the sort of standard so th- we can say that we have a great academy and it's great that you see Callum McGregor Mikey Johnson James Forrest but that is it these days there's not it's, it's not a long list it's a short list um, and yeah I think that something has to change and I do think it has to come from from the academy and the the, the connection there the transition has to be a lot smoother mm-hmm. um, they need to be in bed but there's there's embedding them into the squad, but not just to sit on the bench. Sitting on the bench maybe for a few games, that's great. They're getting used to the environment. But what's the point in having Stephen Welsh sitting on the bench for two seasons? Mm-hmm. Or Anthony Ralston only getting called in when he needs to face Neymar? Or like you say, Stephen Welsh when he needs to face Ibrahimovic? Yeah. Then then they are just coming scapegoats. And it's unfair because then there will be... There will be a lot of flack sent their way, but you're setting them against the best players in the world. You're not setting them against, and no disrespect, but they're not starting against St. Johnson, they're not starting against Ross County, and that's where they need to they need to get some game time and, and embed themselves into the team. You look at, I think it was Stephen Welsh or Scott Robertson, they both had, um, I think it was Stephen Welsh had a really good game against Hamilton last year. Yes. That's not a surprise, though. Like you, you, so you can't be surprised that obviously he plays well against Hamilton, but then you put him up against Ibrahimovic and he doesn't excel. Mm-hmm. No, you've got to give time. And that's where mm-hmm. there is a, an issue between the transition from the academy and to the first team. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And it's something, again, we're talking about strategy, Colin. Sometimes it, it takes something like this for the whole um, culture of the club to change. Now, I think that that is going to have to happen. I think some of that is going to be forced. Um, I mentioned earlier about the, the head of recruitment. He's not had as much criticism, I don't think, than uh, what he should. Because, I mean, when you're looking at the six players we've brought in, how many of them have been hits? You know, if you were to ask me and you run through them, Turnbull's barely played. Barkas, at the moment, you couldn't regard them as a hit. Um, Laxall looked outstanding in his first four or five games. He seems to have regressed 
to the same level as everybody he's playing alongside. El Yunusi, Amy and I were talking about him. He's a nine or a four. The inconsistency mm-hmm. is frightening. Uh, Shane Duffy has definitely not been a hit. I mean, I, I would question anybody that thinks he, he has been. And then a Yeti came in, started off brightly, disappeared into uh, oblivion or sitting on the bench. So the head of recruitment, you've got to look at that. He's going to be the same head of recruitment that's identifying players for January, should there be any investment. I'm going to pull this up, and I don't know how much tongue-in-cheek this is from Kevin Graham. Jack Ross will need these young laddies going forward. And that begs a question about, again, the strategy of the club as a whole, because we're getting a lot of comments coming in in relation to the board. And it's maybe been the fact that winning trophies and winning trebles, and it does mask a lot of deficiencies that have been there for some time. Mm-hmm. And we've had a lot of people who have been unhappy with the board for some time, Colin. But the vast majority, when it comes to football, the people that see what's happening is when the results don't materialise on the park and that's understandable because people are are different people support football differently and if if we've got a winning team on the park then there's no complaints but now when we start stripping back some of the problems that we're facing it's quite clear that they have become complacent and what we've got from our main challengers Rangers is a manager and Steven Gerrard and we can say what we like about him a rookie manager never won anything he's meticulous in everything that he does as a football manager and I know that he's well served uh, with his backroom team as well and that shows you the real value of having a a backroom team a coaching team Colin I mean when we look at that and we've mentioned it before uh, I I, I look at that coaching team Jim Moore threw something at me a curveball last week and he says imagine Neil Lennon wants to go and imagine there is a plan in January for him to go. How would you react if John Kennedy becomes interim manager? And I, I honestly believe that's the board's plan. I mean, that's that's as creative as the board are going to be. Do you think that the Celtic board, Colin, have written off 10 in a row? Do you know, like, I don't think they believe they've done it. But the way we're seeing it, it does look as if they've done that. I mean, the statement that came out and said that we're not going to make a decision until January... So what happens if you go and lose another three or four of these games before then in January? Nothing going to happen because we can't look at it until January. It's it's a ridiculous statement that they came out with. And you're speaking about the head of recruitment and how we need to maybe change uh, behind the scenes. It does need to happen because it's already been announced down south that as of next year, because of uh, Brexit, it's going to be even harder to sign young players from the European Union. Yeah. So there does have to be a complete change in what we're doing here. We can't just go out and try and sign guys from like the Polish second division or guys from uh, like teams that we, that we don't really know a lot about. I mean, guys like Kamala, I don't think that signing would have went through under these new regulations. So we do have to look at it. We do have to look at giving the youth guys a chance. And um, There was perfect opportunities earlier in the season. We've got five substitutions that we can use per game. We're not utilising that. We've got to look at the squad depth. We're not doing it. That game against Ross County could have been a perfect opportunity for someone like Ewan Henderson, for someone like Luca Connell, someone like Sorrell to come in and give Scott Brown a rest. It could have been a game where you could have seen what Dembele could have done on the right-hand side. So there is a lot that needs to go on. You're right, the recruitment hasn't been what we expected of it. What it looked like on paper and what we're seeing in reality is two different things. But you just wonder if that is the coaching side that's not getting the best out of the players. Well, again, there is that argument as well, Colin, because, I mean, obviously, regardless of the the, the fact that we might think Clamalla's good enough or not, or any number of players, we could pick loads of them out, right back to, you know, the days of Kuasi, uh, and all, all these guys, Bio, I mean, there's so many of them, uh, the amount of money we've actually spent and wasted has been frightening, but then you look at some of these players, the first point I would make is, can Celtic produce a striker better than Clamalla at the age of 21? Well, if you're spending two and a half million pound plus in youth development and on an academy, I would suggest that you should be able to produce a striker mm-hmm. who can score um, as many goals as Kamala has in his, in his career, which isn't a, a huge amount of goals. Could we produce a, a centre half better than Marvin Comper to save us one point five million pounds? Yeah, I get that he got a cap for Germany at some stage, but I would say yes. I think we should be able to, as a club that believes that. 
we are a Champions League club now I mean I know the facts don't actually suggest that we are over the last several seasons but if we want to be at that level we need to get so much done better and part of that is the recruitment Colin because you'll always recruit players even in the great 60s and 70s you know the, the players were you know the homegrown talent were supplemented by mainly domestic um, signings but Steen loved going and signing players right? he signed a lot of players so th- this has always been a big part of the Celtic makeup and the Celtic identity whereby we had a core of homegrown players we would often buy some players from other teams within a domestic game and every so often now we would expect to go in if the price was right and the player was right yeah. uh, to go into other markets but I think now we're looking at uh, a situation where Celtic have almost lost their identity you know very few players in the team now are homegrown We've, we're basically bringing in the rejects from the EPL because El you know, see didn't make it there Shane Duffy wasn't playing. A Yeti didn't make it at West Ham. So is that is that our lot as a football club? Would you much rather see us harnessing talent from an academy that's been set up for many, many years now and introducing a 21-year-old striker, a 19-year-old striker that we've developed and, and he's progressed to our own system? Because what then also happens is he knows the mentality of the club. He knows the mentality of the fans, the expectations of what it takes to play for Celtic. I think there has been all too many... Um, aspects uh, of things going wrong happening all at the one time and a part of that is we've got so many players in that changing room now that don't even know what the identity of Celtic is what it means to win 10 in a row so if you've got half a dozen players coming in and only five of them and five of them you know it's just a stepping stone or they're looking for a move back to their native country or back to the EPL then you know as long as Edward does a wee dink over the AC Milan goalie and that's in his uh, video reel then he's happy He's not interested if we're getting beat yeah. from the likes of Ross County in the Cup because that's not going to be on his video reel. It's not going to be on his show reel. So I think there's there's a huge identity crisis at the moment at Celtic Football Club. Now, would we ever have even spoken about this if we were sitting top of the league? Probably not. So maybe we're to blame as well at times as fans. We're fickle. We're only looking at it because things are going wrong. But I think it's an opportunity now to change it. Let's let's go back to what Celtic represents because at the moment what I'm seeing isn't what Celtic represents. You know, we're being run by millionaires and multi-millionaires who are so far removed from the supporters that they're actually putting up barriers from from the front of Celtic Park, a stadium that we paid for, by the way. You know, that wasn't paid for by them. The fans paid for the reconstruction of that stadium. And we're getting told you can't come up to the stadium. We're putting barriers up. So we're putting flags and scarves up on the barriers peacefully. And they're getting torn down. Now, what I would say is, uh, on that note, there's a point coming in from Vinny on the YouTube channel. Slightly ironic the way supporters reacted to Lenin being sent bullets to now shooting for the board to be shot. Uh, Where is the standards? There is always an element, Colin the people who are going to let us down and I, I've got to say I agree with Vinny there's no way any Celtic fan uh, representing the club because that's what you do if you're a Celtic fan should ever be saying that the board should be shot that's just ridiculous and I think that's why you know the fan groups that we've got just off the top of my head you've got the Celtic Trust Colin who are organised you know they're organised you see that there is a strategy there which is tremendous but uh, as well as that you've got a Celtic affiliation you've got a Celtic Supporters Association as well, mm-hmm. and I, I've called to question um, how fit they are for purpose. When I, I certainly haven't seen any statement coming from them on behalf of the supporters, um, they've not liaised. They've maybe liaised with their own members, but because I'm um, from a different perhaps area, or I travel to the games differently, and I don't rely on getting tickets from them, then does that mean my voice it doesn't matter? Because I don't feel as though all the supporters are being represented. I hope that the dialogue that the Celtic Trust has with the club um, is a positive uh, part of that bridge being, kind of that gap being bridged, rather, because I don't feel that the affiliation or the association are doing anything. Has there been no. any statement from them, Colin? No. No, Nothing not that I've seen. No. Right. So what you've then got is you've got the association, for example, who, for me, they're in bed. They're in bed with the club because they get free tickets. You know, they've got tickets for life up there. So why are they going to speak against the club? They don't represent me as a Celtic supporter. Uh, They don't want to rock the boat. So I think what the Celtic Trust are doing um, is excellent because it seems as though they're being proactive in the situation. Um, And I think the other great voice Celtic have at the moment is the Green Brigade. And I think it would be wrong for the club to try and shout them down as well, Colin. You know, I think the Green Brigade are a great voice for the club in times like this, in good times and in bad. And and I'm looking forward to seeing how the Celtic fans are able 
to pull together and have a strategy going forward in terms of the protest. Now, the protest, you know, I would rather it wasn't people going up to the vans, up to the buses rather. I would rather it wasn't banners saying that the board should be shot. So let's collectively come together and protest and do it the way that Celtic should be doing it, the Celtic fans should be doing it. That, that would be my message. And I think yeah. looking at the way the Celtic Trust are conducting themselves, I think they're going to come out with this as leaders, actually, from what I've seen. I, I would say that if there's a, a, a way that you want to look at potentially protesting, um, the availability is still there for people that didn't take it to take their refund for last year's season ticket. And I've seen a lot of people on social media doing that. Now, they say it's about taking money out of the club, but as soon as that started, that's when the board actually started coming out with statements and saying that they were backing Neil Lennon and to get everybody behind the club. It was only when the money was starting to be taken away from the club that the board actually started to react. Now, they're not going to do anything at the minute. If you stop going and buying merchandise, they'll see the sales coming down. If you start taking the money out from the season tickets from last year, they'll see the money coming down. They've already got this year's season ticket. Nobody's going to be in the ground. It's not as if they're going to get pie and Bovril sales. So if the only way that the Celtic board actually start to react is when they see that money's starting to come out of the club, then that's a way that you can do the protest. There's obviously the banners and stuff like that as well. They took away the banners that were put up last night. So it's as if they're just not listening. And you, you mentioned just before that about young players coming through and seeing it. I, I mean, I don't know about Amy's generation, but my generation, when I was coming through, it was guys like Mark Butchell, it was Simon Donnelly, it was Sean Maloney, it was Ross Wallace, it was Stephen McManus. You knew it was guys that were never going to make a big step up to a massive club. I mean, that only changed really when Kieran Tierney came through, but even guys like Aidan McGeady. But that, that was just, you're right in what you're saying. They had an identity. They came through the youth system at the club. And we, we always knew that although they weren't the greatest player, they were always going to put 100% into their performances because they were playing for Celtic. So we have lost our identity to that point. And it's about time that we start turning to these guys and bringing them into the team. That, that's the thing, Colin. You, you, you mentioned yesterday's game and obviously the, the, the names that you mentioned are players who are excel, excelling at that level. But Celtic are failed day players because they're not ready to step into the first team. I mean... Then Belly's regressed. At 13 year old, Amy, he was one of Europe's finest talents, one of the brightest players uh, on the planet. And at 17, he can't get on the bench for Celtic. A struggling Celtic who have no wide players. Now that's player regression and that's youth uh, development gone wrong. So, I mean, th there's big opinions in terms of the protests. And I think everybody, certainly on a Celtic state of mind, Tam Mannion being one of them via Facebook saying, banner saying, shoot the board, don't help. That's what they'd focus on. And the protests are then viewed totally negatively. You're right. You look at the first protest after Ross County, they focus on guys picking up barriers. You, you, they don't focus on everybody who's there peacefully protesting. And then the, the, the next one with regards to focusing on the, the parks of Hamilton coaches getting attacked rather than all the guys standing on the Celtic Way protesting peacefully. So you're spot on, Tam. That's exactly what they will focus on. And I think, as I said before, and this takes into account a point that comes in as well from David J. Lee, 67. How united are we? CSA and affiliation seem relatively quiet maybe they need a ticket to join this is it, are they the voice of the fans because they've been particularly quiet uh, during this uh, downfall, this free fall of Celtic uh, in a season where we should all be looking forward and all we seem to be doing is, is um, you know, gasping at yet another statement from the board that are treating us with nothing but contempt what's the CSA doing, what's the affiliation doing I can see the Celtic Trust being very proactive and uh, they're going to come out of this as the, the true leaders I think and the Green Brigade obviously are the voice of a large part of the Celtic support also um, there's a big question around as well Amy you are obviously from the world of media um, and it will be great to see how your career develops in the future as well but during times like this this happened back in the day uh, well before Colin's time he's a young pup but back in the 90s um, you know, no sentence should ever start with that back in the 90s um, but some of them do yeah, during nah. these, these times. The, the fanzine movement, the street movement, was massive. It was hugely influential. I mean, we had two campaigns as such. You had Save Our Celts and then Celts for Change. And there was a bit of a lull in between times. Um, but a, a massive vehicle for these movements was the fanzines. 
so you had not the few once a Tim um, and these fanzines are still around today well n- not the few certainly as once a Tim's uh, editor Matt McGowan now runs the alternative view so the fanzine culture is still there within Celtic but they were so so influential in giving supporters a voice not just that but they were educating supporters this is wrong because again the centenary double masked a lot of problems you know that's what I was saying success you know the deficiencies disappear if you win a double in the centenary season there was major financial problems at Celtic um, developing from a board at that time who were incompetent they didn't know how to run a club going into the 1990s into this new generation where you know Sky Sports broadcasting was just around the corner all seater stadium was going to be required due to the um, the Hillsborough disaster and the tragedy at Hillsborough uh, and we had a board that were incompetent they weren't fit for purpose so the fans realised that really really early on I mean not the view we set up in 19 87. You know, the, the takeover happened seven years later, and they were talking about the, the club being a, 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 you know, a PLC, you know, because at that time it was a privately owned company by a very small group of people, and we're talking about let's float shares, let's allow the club, um, you know, shares to be bought by fans, and they, they were ahead of their time. But what I see sometimes is some people saying that new media, if you like, or alternative media, uh, some might even say rebel media, um, podcasts, broadcasts, that's that's where it, is, it exists now, bloggers. Uh, and again, they're viewed by content, but not just by the club, but by fellow supporters sometimes. So when you have an opportunity, for example, um, like I will be this evening speaking to BBC Sports Sound, you get criticised for taking that opportunity because people say you are basically massaging your own ego or you're going to get another 35 followers on Twitter. It's not about that. What it's about is trying to influence the narrative and that's exactly what the fanzines did back in the day. So if you've got a podcast and you're invited to actually speak to... um, someone who's on a platform much bigger than any of the the bloggers or the podcast can possibly have, why wouldn't you take it? So Amy, you are from the media, you've got a media background and future. How do you feel about that crossover between alternative media and mainstream media? I think you're spot on. It's all about influencing the narrative. I think that's hitting the nail on the head. Um, I don't quite understand that, like you say, so if you're appearing on Sports Sound tonight, you'll, you'll face a fair bit of backlash and that's you just know that's going to happen. That's an absolute certainty. But why? It's like you say, it's not you massaging your own ego. You're not saying that you're speaking for the fans. You're not You're not saying that you're speaking for the whole Celtic fan base. But there needs to be some sort of link. Now, I think as well, there's a... There's a discontent amongst fans, but there's also there's it's, there's just a confusion. You can't at one so like for your example for you for you um, appearing on Sky a few weeks ago, you'll see in the comments people will go right. You're hearing from Andy Walker. Why are you constantly hearing from Andy Walker? Why are you hearing from David Proven? Why are you hearing from these sort of people? Then you appear or Sean McDonald yesterday, the day before from the Blether podcast, he appears. So he's something a bit different, like you say the new media. Then that still gets a bit of backlash as well. So it's really like it's a, it's a no-win situation. You try and inject something different. You try and bring a, a closer view from the fans. You're not saying, like, see, you've never once said that like, you're speaking for the whole fan base of Celtic. It's your opinion. Um, but you can't one minute go, oh, Andy Walker... What what does he know? Charlie Nicholas. What does he's? It's um, it's all it's all backwards thinking. Mm-hmm. Then so you you bring in somebody forward, more forward thinking like yourself, Sean McDonald, and then it's the same same sort of backlash. So it's just one of those. It's a real catch twenty two situation, and there's there just seems to be you just can't win. You just can't win. No, you're right, and I think mm-hmm. when you're looking at the growth in uh, new media, alternative media, uh, fan media. You know, you look at the growth in that and you look at, for example, the Celtic state of mind. Uh, YouTube videos are getting bigger figures than Celtic's official videos on YouTube. And that's because, and I get this from the media team at Celtic. And by the way, the, the people that do criticise you think you're trying to get a job at a club. I'm not trying to get the job at a club. I've got a job right here. I, I don't need to go and work for the club and then everything's sanitised then. And you can't say anything that you want and it's the stock questions with people that speak to the Celtic view. That's not my end game. So... If, if you're working for Celtic Media, there's so many restraints and constraints that they're working on. They can't ask difficult questions. They just can't do it. There's a party line. They've got to tow it. But I think when you're looking at the fan media column, the club shouldn't underestimate how powerful a message can be. If you look at 
for example, and this is a shameless plug, but we've got the quadruple treble charity weekender coming up. We now have, and this is beyond Axon, 20 different shows. So there's actually 21 contributors for that weekend. The vast majority of them are podcasts, Celtic podcasts. Mm-hmm. We've also got people like St. Rocks. Uh, we've got Just Confirmed, and it'll go out on Twitter. The Cano Foundation are taking an hour on that weekender as well. This is the strength because some people who maybe listen to Celtic Underground perhaps don't listen to Axom, and that's fine. You get other people who just, you know, they immerse themselves in podcasts and listen to half a dozen of them. And that's fine as well, but it does show that the, the, the influence can be heard by, let's mm-hmm. say, when we had David Lowe on a Celtic State of Mind a couple of months back, or if we have the Celtic Trust on here in the coming days, which, you know, I, I would welcome that. So I think that when we're looking at a situation like this and Celtic are in free fall or it's a crisis or a mini crisis, then I think that uh, the, the fans should maybe embrace what podcasters and broadcasters and vloggers and bloggers are doing, because it's at times like these that we can really get a message out. Definitely. I mean, all you have to do, if anyone didn't see, obviously the podcast was up for an award at the Football Content Awards last night. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't win anything. But when you take a look at the people that's out there and who's actually contributing across the whole of the UK, there was over like a thousand podcasts nominated for awards. It does show that there's a the power of fan media out there. All you have to do is take a look at some of the teams down south. Arsenal's Fan TV, uh, Liverpool's The Anfield Rap. Um, even across the city at Rangers, they've got um, different podcasts that's out there. They've even had Dave King on their podcast speaking about what he's going to do with his shares coming up. So there is a platform there for clubs to reach out to to fan media to get them on, not get them on side, but to help put their point across. And when you look at it, the the, the documentary series for Sunderland, as bad as they, that club is being run, the owners of that club actually went in and did a fans podcast every week where mm. they took phone calls from the fans and gave, put their point across. And then when you look at it, they still managed to put 40,000 seats in a stadium in Sunderland when they're on League One down south. Yep. The power of what actually happens when the people from the board come and put their points across can't be understated. But at Celtic, it just seems to be we'll put this information into the Daily Record or we'll put this information into the Sun or we'll put this information into the Mirror or whatever. That's that's the old way of doing things and we're stuck in the past in that sense. We've actually got to communicate with the people, like you're saying, that are getting more views, getting more hits than the mainstream media because fans are turning away from it and they're wanting to hear the points being put across by the fans for the fans. Yep, absolutely. Now... Is it true that you're still working on your Netflix documentary behind the scenes at Arbroath with Dick Campbell? Because for me, that would su- that would supersede anything that I've seen on uh, Amazon <laughs> or Netflix. Dick Campbell in full flow. That would be tremendous. Fantastic. Now, JP is commenting on YouTube. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe. It's all free or, or YouTube content. And I think we just broke through the 6,000 subscribers mark overnight, Colin, which is great. Another Incredible. milestone. The majority yep. of fans, says JP, didn't want Neil appointed. This isn't hindsight. KDS Forum ran a poll at the time. Lenin got about 5% of the votes. Now, that, that's interesting because on the night before the Scottish Cup final against Hearts, I was at a live event, Colin, and it was mm-hmm. with Rab Douglas, Alan Thompson and John Hartson. And obviously mm-hmm. part of the, the gig is always that you throw the questions out to the crowd. And the, the question was, who should Celtic? get in charge uh, Big John Hartson took the mic because obviously he's very close to Neil and he says Neil Lennon and he asked for a show of hands and I would have said at that time it wasn't quite 50-50 it was probably veering on 60-40 against at that time so 5% I'm not saying it didn't happen but I know that it was more against than for at that time so it isn't with hindsight that people are saying that we did see that there was a definite change from having Brendan Rodgers in charge to moving back to Neil Lennon and it's come home to roost I think the Celtic board have become complacent and people thought I was having a cheap dig at Rangers yesterday when I mentioned to Lawrence about here's a club that you know in 2012 were entered into the bottom league in Scotland I wasn't a cheap dig. We all know what happened. It doesn't matter what I say. But let's let's take it from that point of view. And their rise through the leagues, Colin, regardless of how they've done it, mm-hmm. they were a million miles away from Celtic. Mm-hmm. And I just feel that Celtic, at the very highest echelons, have become complacent. They have been laughing 
at, at Rangers and the threat from Ibrox because I mean it was a drama it was just an absolute it was a berserker's case I mean it was a shit show at Ibrox for years right and they didn't think it was ever going to get better so they've become complacent and they were rich and they were cash rich and now very very quickly they didn't see this coming and they're not prepared for it so yeah. I don't think there is a plan B I, I really don't. And the only thing that's going to make any kind of difference is like what you said, Colin, it's the fans. But it's about being organised. But the only leaders I see at the moment in terms of groups and associations, many of whom have been in uh, existence for since year dot, is the Celtic Trust. They seem to be very proactive in, in their approach to this. Uh, so I would urge everybody to check them out if you haven't done so already, become a member. Um, and again, as I say, I'm, I'm opening up uh, this platform on Axom. If, if any of the, you know, the, um, the heads of that trust want to come and speak to us, brilliant. You're, you're more than welcome. Let's speak to the mm-hmm. fan base uh, and spread the word. How, how can we approach this that isn't going to show Celtic fans in a bad light? Because that's yeah. important. People get frustrated, Colin. And you imagine the scenes. Tomorrow night, here we go. Here's a wee prediction. Amy, how do you, th- how do you see the game going tomorrow? I'm not confident. Um, I don't... I think it's going to be two from 13. I'm not feeling confident at all. I think because we know... I think I think we know that it's just going to be the same. It's going to be Scott Brown. It's going to be Lax Allen. It's going to be Edward. I just think, what's going to be the difference from, from Prague, from Milan? It's just... A, the there's just there's no sense of anything going to look like it's going to change tomorrow. Um, so I think I think it's I don't like to be so pessimistic about things, but I don't I have no faith, I have no confidence in in the team, and I certainly don't have any confidence right now in in the staff. Now, so it's a defeat for you. It's a defeat for me. It's yeah. a defeat tomorrow night, Colin. Yeah, I mean, you said at the time when we got the the draw away in Lille. Your point was that, that this result would age over time because you see the kind of performance yep. that we put in there and we look at um, the team that Lille are. And Lille are a fantastic side this season. And you've got to remember that they're going to be coming over here and they'll be looking to get revenge for the fact that we managed to get a point over there. So they'll not turn up as if this is just going to be a dead rubber. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll want to get the win because they want to keep their momentum going. Yep. But Amy's right. I just feel as if nothing's going to change. We're going to see Scott Brown in the middle of the park. We're going to see Lax out at left back. We're going to see Frimpong on the right-hand side. We'll probably see Beaton playing at centre-half ahead of guys like Duffy and uh, Welsh. There has to be a point where tried and tested is done. We, we can't rely on tried and tested because, I mean, guys like Scott Brown have played five games in 16 days. That's a lot for somebody at the age of 35. I know. But we're talking about we're not blooding these youngsters in. We're not giving them a chance to get into the first team. You've just got to throw them in. You've just got to give them the chance, especially in a game like Thursday night where, apart from the money element of getting the £500,000 if you win, there's nothing else to be gained out of it apart from the experience. We did it last year away to Cluj, a game that you were at, and we've seen guys like Dembele and Robertson getting a chance. Played and Robertson, Robertson was open. Yeah. yeah. We had guys like Robertson that were opened up to fans that hadn't seen him before. Now mm-hmm. he's out on loan and he's performing really well on loan. So it's time to give these guys a chance. The thing is as well, Colin, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with anything that you or Amy said in terms of the, the team selection either because you know we'd all love to see the introduction of some new faces in the team but Lenny's playing it safe. Um, he's, he's trying to go with the tried and tested. He's also been very, very reserved in his uh, post-match in terms of throwing players under the bus which has become a bit of a cliche this season when we're talking about post-match interviews with Neil Lennon uh, because he doesn't want to completely lose the dressing room just to throw another cliche into the mix as well. But it's not ideal just to throw them in. Colin, I get what you're saying. We shouldn't be in a situation where we're throwing them in. We should be in a situation where, right, there's Dembele, he's played 30 games. Mm -hmm. You know, because he made his debut, as you say, at 16 years of age. He was on the bench for that game against Hearts when we won the Scottish Cup 2-1. I mean, he's been there or thereabouts and he's played very little football. Um, These are the the types of players that I think I was referring to at the top of the show. They should be um, tried and tested, certainly on a domestic level, so that if you come up against a European side at home, fairly safe surroundings the guys aren't going to freeze it's not going to damage them I mean throwing Welsh in against Rangers throwing Welsh in against Ibrahimovic come on I mean that that is not ideal it's a sink or swim scenario no matter how good you are I mean we've seen players reacting well to that Colin I mean David Marshall in goals against Barcelona we've seen it Stephen Craney 
played particularly well against Ronaldinho against Barcelona as well I remember that but then the flip side of that there's Ralston talking about things aging well that picture of him with Neymar certainly has not aged well you know it hasn't and that's because we're throwing guys in in situations where they should be much better prepared to deal with that so we we should have five young guys where we could maybe bleed them in we've got a goalkeeper situation where you know who would you rather play Bain or Barkas it's really just finger in the air stuff at the moment uh, yeah, we've got Connor Hazard with international experience. He's not ready for Celtic's first team. Why? And that's because we've not managed or progressed him properly. He's not had enough games. He should be playing against St Mirren at home. He should be playing against Hamilton. He should be getting games under his belt at that level. And he, we're just not doing it. And I think the complacency set in. So we're now at that situation where we, we really have taken our eye off the bigger picture. It's all been about make sure we win the league. Make sure we win the league. And it's just looking at the next game in front of you. Unfortunately now, we're looking at the next game in front of us with a bit of trepidation. Every game that comes round. So we're playing Lille tomorrow night and for me they're I would say they're the best team I've faced actually this season you know from what I've seen I think Lille are are the most impressive team we've we've faced and not just the game against us Colin but obviously how they're performing domestically and in their other European games that could be another humbling Um, we could be in the record books for all the wrong reasons and because of that because Neil Lennon obviously is gripping on with his fingertips with fingernails to this job he doesn't want that so he's going to play the tried and tested, which means that 35-year-old Scott Brown, who, who already has played far too much games this season, will start against Kilmanic having played on the Thursday night. And, and, and it's, a, it's a cycle, actually, that should have been stopped and it should have been curbed before now. Give me a prediction for tomorrow, Colin. Uh, uh, do you know, I, I'd have more confidence if we didn't go with the tried and tested tomorrow. I'd have more confidence if we threw the young lads in and gave them a chance because... They've surely got to step up and show why they should be part of the team and I feel you'd get more out of them than what you get out of the tried and tested. If you go with the same team as what we put out at the weekend, I'd expect maybe, I don't know, 3-1 to Lille. But I I would give the the younger boys more of a chance because I feel as if there's more hunger coming out of them, there's more drive to do better. Um, When I look at Celtic this season, I just see a slow progression going forward the ball goes left to right to left to right and it's slow, so slow in the build up it's time to try something new and you never know if the boys are actually out there then I'd, I'd probably have more hope for them than what I'd have for the first team you know there has been that approach this season when you're watching the games it's frustrating as hell I mean the, f- the first half against Hibs at Easter Road was a carbon copy actually the first half against St Johnston at Celtic Park and you just knew you're not going to teams are finding it extremely easy to play against Celtic if Celtic are on the attack that transition if the attack breaks down is being pounced upon by every team we play because we are terrible in transition so we're losing the ball be that a save or you know we've missed a chance and the possession's given back that transition to then defend we are struggling big time to do that Colin so before you know it that team's on the attack on the counter attack and we don't have the defenders that are up to that up to that kind of standard now I've said all season that the the Ayers-Julien partnership last season was good enough it certainly was good enough last season it's it's not looked good enough this season now a big part of that when I'm looking at Julien and I I really do regard Julien as one of our our best centre halves Colin which isn't saying much when you look at who we've got as centre half but look at two of the goals look at the the, the goal that um, was the penalty that was given away first and foremost against Ross County simple cross box pass that Julian couldn't deal with this is a guy who under 20 level won the World Cup with France we paid 7 million quid for him he can't deal with a simple ball across the face of goal the same thing happened against St Johnson you look at May getting the ball on the left hand side who's the player that's lunging in using all his height and the, the length of his legs and trying to, lunging in that's because it's terrible positional sense Mm -hmm. now generally when you look at the goals we've been losing this season it's came from a Celtic attack and that transition from us losing the possession in attack to then turning into a defensive formation has been non-existent at Celtic this season that comes down to coaching Julian Mm -hmm. hasn't become a bad player from last season that comes down to coaching it comes down to shape it comes down to how we actually set up now that, that that's pretty basic, though, isn't it? I mean, that, I'm not a coach, and I know that that's what ha- has to happen, and we're not doing it, and that's because we don't have 
the standards of manager or coach in place that's required to compete even domestically now, never mind in Europe. And that saddens me. Now, Bromsgrove boy, Celtic, like all clubs, ignore fans media at their peril. Yet another thing the club just don't get. And again, you know, just to throw something else in from Mark, who is uh, commenting on YouTube from experience, the club will be watching, listening, and noting all that's said on here. The club, the clubs follow the indie groups, podcasts, and forums. Now, that's that's. I think I'm on the verge. I'm on. I'm edging towards what Mark says there. I think that when something's happening, Colin. They do ignore, they should ignore uh, social media and they should ignore fan media at their absolute peril. Now, Amy, we have approached Peter Lowell for an interview. Yep. And the reason we did it wasn't attention-seeking, as some have suggested. Um, it was because it was suggested on this show, because someone gave us a £1,000 to charity on the proviso that we got an interview with Peter Lowell. Yep. They paid us a £1,000 anyway. That was then topped up to ten grand by a second company who have said to us that their money was sitting at the club from a corporate package and it probably would have sat there. But now they're thinking, I'm not going to leave it with the club. So does it go to charity? Well, that all stands on the decision by Peter Lowell. It's not an attention-seeking um, stunt by a Celtic state of mind. But I mean, we have had a lot of high-profile people on the show. I'd love to speak to Peter Lowell. Amy, if you could ask him one question, what would it be? Put you on the spot, Colin. Get wow. thinking. You get. You're up next. Colin, you've got a bit of time. Um, what would I ask him? Seventeen years. Why? Mm -hmm. Do you think that again? Looking why? at the structure of the club, that's a big thing that we need need to look at. And maybe I the way Barcelona so. does it. That's um, It's the Barcelona. I'm seventeen years. That's pretty much my entire lifetime. Like, and it's been one man and one. Stop role. showing off, him. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that that's not healthy in no. any sort of business in any corporation. I think Barcelona have I like the as it's every six years I think it's an election. Yeah. Um mm -hmm. and I think that's something that should be embedded across Europe. Especially and it's start, starting at Celtic. Seventeen years, like I say, seventeen years is a long, long time. That's longer than some people have a career. Never mm. mind to be sitting in one job. And I think you've mentioned it a few times, you looked up the um articles at the time when he got the job and it was supposed to all be non playing issues. Yep. Well, 17 years down the line. He's now the director of football. Exactly. Yep, that's so. a great question. Colin, you've had a couple of minutes. I threw Amy right on the spot there, and I think she came back with a great question. What would you ask Peter Lowe? I'd ask him, uh, what temperature does it need to be for the snow to melt on his heated driveway? No, I'm, I'm kidding. No, he spoke about the, the four-year plan that they have, so that every two years... Basically, if someone comes in, you develop them for two years and then it gets to the point of whether you sell them or you renew the contract for another two years. Over the last couple of seasons, that has definitely changed. We're looking at guys like Ryan Christie, who has basically got 18 months left on his contract. So mm -hmm. we've that, that situation's moved on. Edward only has 12 months left on his contract at the end of the summer. What has changed over that last couple of years that means that the process that you did have working for you now no longer works and why and what is the, the new process going forward to ensure that we keep developing the talent that makes that that nine years that we had of success isn't just a one-off that we continue to be dominant in Scottish football mm -hmm. Excellent and by the way you know I wouldn't uh, write off the interview just yet but uh, we have been in dialogue with the club uh, we haven't yet had anything confirmed, but um, we will try our utmost to get an interview. It won't, I mean, let's be honest, it won't be a live broadcast. Um, I don't think that he would ex accept the fact that fans might ask questions live, although the viewing figures would be pretty big. Um, but if we get the opportunity, it would be absolutely with respect and we would ask the questions that Celtic fans want answered. I mean, what is, where does he see the club in five years? Simple question. Do, you, do we know that, though? Do we know what the plan is in five years for this club? Because I always felt, uh, love them or loathe them, and most love them uh, with hindsight, but Fergus McCann, you knew where the club was going. You knew what the strategy was. And it just seems as though we're just living season to season. As long as we keep winning the league, everything's rosy. Uh, what is the aspirations? Because we've had the news recently, Colin, about uh, you know one of these transatlantic leagues. That's an idea that's been hanging around for about 20 years now. Uh, we've been told you'll never join the English League, so there was always these options of, uh, you know, a clutch of teams from all over Europe 
playing in a different league. We're no longer part of that. We're not around the table. Why? What is the plan? There's loads of big, you know, big plans, headed recruitment, um, you know, coaching staff that uh, don't work together because they've just been thrown together. It's not worked before. How does he think it's going to work this season? The Brendan Rodgers saga. Um, and again, uh, people have kind of revised history there. Brendan Rodgers uh, and Peter Lowell, obviously, I mean, I would love to speak about that because it wasn't uh, certainly all rosy in the garden there come the, come the end. That would be an interesting uh, dynamic to hear about. Now, Ali Kerr, getting back to some of the football chat, the fact that David Turnbull hasn't had his chance is baffling. It baffles me. I've heard that he was bought as one of these project signs for next season, which I find absurd. We're struggling to win domestic games. He knows the domestic game. He's yeah. played his whole career in Scottish football. Uh, he was one of potentially the most promising footballer in Scottish football. We buy him, having chased him for that length of time, and we don't play him. Mm-hmm. He came on against St. Johnson, Colin. I thought the whole tempo took a lift when he came on. What's yep. your thoughts? Do we drop Brown for tomorrow night and play Turnbull? That'd be my first I mean, move. Yeah, I mean, I'll go through the team I've got written down here. Um, I've got Barkas and goal, a back three of Duffy, Julian and Ayer, Thrimpong at right back, Taylor at left back, Sorrow, Turnbull, Rogic and Griffiths up front. And I'd like to see Turnbull coming in and actually um, playing that box-to-box midfielder role because I think he worked very well when he came on at the weekend. Um, he's, he did things that other players weren't trying. That lofted ball over the top into Griffiths was something different. Before that, it was a lot of pass, pass, pass. The only other thing that I've seen that's similar to that over the last few weeks was the pass from Rogic into a Yeti, where he tried the wee flick and it came off. We're, we're not trying different things. We're just going back to the tried and tested. We're passing the ball out, we put the ball over. We're trying to break through a defence that's got 10 in front of you. At least when Turnbull came on, he tried something different. He brought that energy. So I'd definitely see him start tomorrow and I'd see Sorrell play alongside him. Interesting. Now, Amy, we had a wee chat beforehand. We were speaking about the um, the dilemma around players like El Yunusi, Rogic and Encham because I just think that you look at his, you know, Encham's been called an enigma. I just call him inconsistent. You know, he gets a nine or a four. But my frustration is we've got three players like that because El Yunusi's like that and Tom Rogic's like that as well. I mean, I've seen him completely anonymous in Europe this year. Um, and then he, he can do something like he did against AC Milan and it reminds you just how spectacular he can be in dispatches because, you know, we don't see it for 90 minutes, let's be honest. But yeah. what he can give you, other players in the park can't. I would be very reluctant to start all those three players in any game. I'd play one of them um, at a push because if all three of them give you the four, you're, you're struggling straight off the bat. They're almost becoming luxury players. Yeah, I am. I'm more in the Tom Rogic camp than anything, and um, than anyone. Like you see, I think Eli Nussi is 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 a nine or a four. I think everyone goes back to the semi final performance against Hibs in the Betfred Cup. Now that's great, but that's a that's over a year ago now. Yep. Um, the last standout, like even against I think Aberdeen or whatever, he's, he's grabbing a few goals. Yeah, he's grabbing the goals, but it's not a great performance. Um, and it's the same in Europe. Yeah, he's grabbing some goals, but. Is it a great performance? No, not really. Um, he's not often. I think we spoke, like you say, we spoke about it before. There is no width in Celtic this year, and I think that f- throughout the nine, that has been um, arguably the biggest factor. If it be James Forrest, if it be Scott Sinclair, it all Paddy Roberts. <laughs> Paddy Roberts. It all came from the width. Now, I think more than ever, it's proven how much James Forrest is vital to the Celtic side still. I think his absence has been so clear. Mm-hmm. But um, And like you say, the, losing Mikey Johnson, who did, it was the fringes, but it looked like it was it was starting to all come together. But there's just, I think Colin said it earlier as well, it's just so predictable. It's so predictable. Celtic are so narrow. Um, and I think I think playing Christy out on it, Chris out on the wing and that's just, it's not his ideal position and I think that's also to still to try and shoehorn Rogic in because Rogic hasn't got the pace nowhere near the pace to be on the wing so it has to be Christie. but it's just shoehorning players in um, out of position um, so yeah it's one of those ones I would if anything I'd start Rogic I, he, I'm, like I say I'm in his camp more than I'm in the Eli Nussi camp and more than, in, than I'm in the Encham camp but if I am in the Encham camp it's to have him in that deeper position I'd maybe mm. have him in beside Turnbull tomorrow just 
like in an ideal situation just for a little bit more experience because I'd like Callum McGregor to have a rest as well um, I think the work he does off the ball is outstanding and I think that would be missed mm-hmm. um, and I think that goes unnoticed sometimes but tomorrow I would have if Incham has to play then it has to be in that deeper role because in that in that more number 10 role he's just he just gets lost um, he does and I just mm-hmm. don't think he has that creative edge. But who does have that creative edge in the Celtic side these days? You mentioned yeah. uh, resting McGregor. I would certainly rest him in a game like tomorrow night rather mm-hmm. than a cup game against Ross County, uh, exactly. which I yeah, found absolutely absurd as well. Strange love the doctor I'm taking on board. Ask why the share price is going up. Very interesting indeed. And Gigi wants me to ask him where John Kennedy gets his snoots. So both ends of the scale there. Um, if we do get the, the interview, uh, I would love to be able to share that with you it would it would certainly be on the the Saturday night Colin the 19th um, as a YouTube premiere but you know we're in discussions let's see what happens with that um, you will be the first to know now as Colin quite rightly pointed out to ruin my day we didn't win the award last night uh, unfortunately we weren't there it was all a bit of a damp squib if I'm being honest with you watching it unfold on Twitter uh, but it's great to be nominated and I'll take that as a wee feather in our cap so thanks everybody for getting involved and getting behind a Celtic state of mind we aim to keep growing it and we aim to keep bringing more voices and personalities onto the show hence the reason that Amy is with us today uh, Natasha joined us yesterday. We have another uh, new face on Friday. I wonder who that could be. Um, but one final reminder: uh, we are running a quadruple treble charity weekender. We're top to, we're almost at four grand. We got a lovely message, Colin, from one of your big pals, Gianni Capaldi, uh, mm-hmm. wishing us all the best with the fundraiser. But please, the link should be underneath your video. Um, we produce free content if you think it's worth a couple of quid over a year please donate it to us and we're hoping to raise loads of cash for the most vulnerable within society it's sometimes the hardest time of the year at Christmas when you know kids are waking up with no gifts and people are waking up with no Christmas meals or or even a decent winter's jacket Colin so hopefully we can we can assist people uh, we'll keep pushing it and looking forward to the weekend and as I've said at the beginning of the show or during the show the Kano Foundation are now on board we've got 20 shows plus Axom I just need to work out the scheduling now. Uh, But thank you to everybody who's got involved today. Uh, All that's left for me to say is Colin Watt and Amy Canavan. Thank you for joining me on A Celtic State of Mind. Thanks, guys. 